Yeah, when I was, what was it, the fourth grade, um, my mom and I got evicted from our house. How did you do that? Um, I don't know. I just remember, like, asking my friends, I think, if I could stay with them. And then I remember asking my aunt, and she said no. Mm -hmm. It was, like, a lot of, like, doors being closed on me, but, like, we got through it. Previously in Greater Boston. Cheese robots, his hands. No, no, not again. Isaiah went straight to Isabel's red line apartment. He told her everything about dipshit, about the commune, about Wonderland. Hi, Charlotte, me and Isaiah need your help. I've met fake Mika. Why are you messing with her? I'm not. If I can keep the chase going, that works out for her because the show is good and she gets to be the star. There hasn't been a grocery delivery in a while. Cool. Yeah, you want it in really character voice or anything? All right. Malden. Red Dorchester. Somerville. Red Roxbury. Yeah, Somerville. Yeah. This? Somerville. Yeah. Uh, I've never been my whole life. I live Bright. in Milton, Massachusetts. Rosendale. And Boston, Dorchester. South Boston. This is. Brockton. Medford, Massachusetts. Red Line. Dorchester. This is. This is. This is. Greater Boston. This week in Greater Boston, episode 34, The Storm on the Sea of Galilee. They arrive in the middle of the night, while the trains are shut down for the evening. Some file out of a secret location down the subway tunnel from the Kendall MIT stop. Others were positioned ahead of time inside maintenance closets at a dozen red line stations, inbound at Park Street, outbound at Andrew, inbound at Savin Hill, outbound at Wollaston. They wait for... Uh, wait... Ugh. This is threatening to evict the family. There's, there's too much noise. Too much to know where to... How can it? think it took more of this. They wait for activation, and then emerge slowly, minimizing their mechanical movement as much as possible. They move steadily into position, into spots where the licensed buskers always perform for would-be commuters in the morning. Then, they promptly power down, for now. Does she really think we haven't heard already? We don't need reminders three times a day. She knows. She just enjoys reminding us. The more she demands our attention, the less we ought to give it to her. We shouldn't be leaving. This is your home. Why are we letting her take your home? What am I supposed to do? Have myself a little arm standoff like some Midwestern militia taking over a nature reserve? That won't go nearly so well for me as it did for them, and you know it. It's your home. It's a house. I've seen plenty of houses come and go. I'm not getting myself shot for this one. So if you don't mind, I'd like to just focus on getting all my things into boxes for the time being. I've got your dishes all packed. What's next? If you wouldn't mind getting a starter on the books. On it. Are you going to be able to fit all this in Isaiah's apartment? I got a storage unit. Most everything is going there for now. So many times I've made fun of my sister for buying a ridiculous oversized house in the suburbs. Now all that extra space is filled up with my own furniture. At least you and I have places to fall back on. A lot of folks don't. Melissa, Louisa, good. Uh, this is my friend Omi. Hello. What did the lawyer have to say? It's a pretty mixed bag. The contract is very clear about community car owners' obligations to admit passengers. There's no denying we're in violation of the contract. We could press a case that the contract itself is improper, but that's a long shot. The good news? The contract doesn't state whether evicted residents should be refunded the purchase price of seized homes. It's shaky. But we can try a class action suit to get evicted residents their money back. Well, that's good. That's good, right? Yeah, if we win, that's good. But suits like that take years. 
We've got hundreds of people who lost their homes and won't have funds to go anywhere else until that money comes back, if it does. My part went more smoothly. I've got a good lead on that commune. Gemma had names for some of them from Paletti's visitor logs, and she's looking for those people right now. And meanwhile, I managed to track down a copy of the lease on the property to see whose name it was in. Particle Physics Vander Molen. Particle Physics? That's a person's name. Yeah, I feel you. But seriously, if we stop to marvel at every oddball name in this group, we'll spend the whole day just on that. What about dipshit? I've got an inside tip he's being held somewhere around Kendall Square, but I don't have the exact location. And without RLPD resources, I can't exactly arrange a door-to-door search. But I'm meeting with Particle Physics in person this afternoon. They want to help in any way they can. And if we coordinate with them and their commune, that could be another 16 set of eyes we've got searching. I'm going with you. I figure. Thank you, Louisa. You've done so much for our family. (laughs) Hey, I'm happy to have a client. Launching a PI business isn't exactly easy. You haven't even asked for payment. I'm sure you'll write me a wonderful testimonial. Now, besides, Gemma's a friend, and finding dipshit is important to her, too. And Charlotte would be here herself if she wasn't buried in obligations for managing the transition. That Vincenzo kid isn't exactly smoothing the process the way Melissa would have. I'm sorry. I know I should be there. No, no. It's not like that. She just misses you is all. She knows you've got big problems of your own. And how's that going, Melissa? Have you found a place yet? My roommates all have parents and significant others to move in with. I don't. We won't let you go homeless. We'll find you a place somehow. I thought about asking Charlotte and Gemma, but I'm worried about getting them in trouble for harboring a terrorist. That's insane. No, Melissa's right. I expect Bespin is looking for any excuse she can find to toss the Linda Coolidge's out with the rest of us. They'd risk it. Melissa, they care about you. I don't want them to take that risk. Not with a baby to worry about. So what do we do about this? Well, we keep talking to the lawyer. Build a case. No, I mean right now. What do we do now? We've got hundreds of people about to be homeless, a third of the population of Redline, 30% of a whole city. And Melissa, I'm sorry, I know you're in this mess with us, but when it comes down to it, folks who look like you will eventually find a landlord to give you a chance. But most of the people getting kicked out right now don't look like you. I know. If you've got ideas, I'm listening. Tell me, how do we stop this? We don't. We can't. The law's not on our side. Nothing new there, so we've got to change our thinking. We can't stay here, we can't all scatter to new homes, because those new homes aren't waiting for us. And anyway, if we do that, then we've got no power. If we disperse, we become invisible. So where can we go? Where can we all go together? Oh. What are you talking about? Like, buy one big apartment building? How do we even do that? No, that's idealism. And we don't have time for that, let alone money. We can't buy anything. Apartments aren't the priority. We need working plumbing and a roof big enough to cover all our heads. Like uh, a warehouse? Or an abandoned store, like an old Walmart. You're talking about squatting. Hell with squatting. I'm talking about colonizing. Fair's fair, right? We find the land we want and we take it. We make it ours and let them try to come push that many people out. This could be a dangerous plan, Isaiah. This could be a path to justice. We need to find a place. We have the place. Louisa, you've been there already. What's to stop us from taking Wonderland? Uh, I mean, not much, I guess. There's no one there. They cleared out completely. Who owns it? A used to belong to the Bespins, believe it or not. They sold it to Oliver West. Well, that's as perfect as it gets, isn't it? Who's going to side with West after all this? Hold up. Emily Bespin sold a theme park to the same man who undermined my Mario campaign by framing my nephew for terrorist acts. Yeah, our investigation into the lottery is bigger than we've been able to make public. There were a lot of complications around potentially tainting the investigation before, but now we're all private citizens again. Charlotte wants you to know everything. But before that, you also need to know that Oliver West is technically dead. What? I just saw him at Wonderland. He's the one responsible for the dipnapping. Uh, I don't doubt it, but it looks like he may have done a fancy bit of ass-covering paper trail magic, because ding-dong, he's dead. At least in legal terms. Now the question is, where does that leave Wonderland? And more important, if you were to occupy it as squatters for a long period of time, where does that leave you as rightful owners? I'm on it. You keep looking for dipshit, 
I'll see what I can track down about the legal status of the Wonderland property. So we're agreed. We're doing this. We get a new home for us and for my friends, and we take it right from the people who left us all homeless in the first place. I'm in. I'll help if I can. I guess so. Yeah. It seems like it's your turn, Isaiah. I'm with you. They wait. Commuters and citizens bustle by, paying them no mind. Some drop dollars at their feet. They do not move. Hey, what the hell? <coughs> Ow! Many dollars get taken back, a string of curses replacing the previous attempts at generosity. They will not move until they're ordered to. They wait for the signal. They've been programmed with specific... Very specific, very specific, uh, uh, what is, what, what's, what is? Please, please help me. Breathe, Mr. Pillay. I'm here. We're in this together. I, I don't know where I am. You're in a lab near the Kendall MIT train station. People are coming to help you. I promise you that. Breathe and focus on what you see. Through your eyes, not in your mind. Stare right into the eyes of your captain. Remember his face. Hold steady. Breathe. Oh. Ah. Ah. Okay. Okay. They... They have been programmed with specific patients. They're machines designed to control machines. They will control them well when the time comes. Occasionally, a busker who used to perform in the spaces they now occupy comes by to spit in their faces or give them the finger or attempt to push them away, always unsuccessfully. As they take the abuse, faint glints of energy flicker in their eyes as if they're considering powering up and retaliating but no, they have their programming. They've been programmed for patience. They wait. It's, um, it's, uh, it's clear to me that my uh, end is, is coming. There's been uh, no food delivered in weeks, and uh, I, f I finished the perishables almost a month ago. I've, uh, I've eaten the cereal, the canned soups, and um, baked beans. Uh, yeah, the, the canned celery, but uh, I didn't know uh, <laughs> canned celery was a uh, an actual thing. It shouldn't be. It's so... Uh, uh, and... So many tins of caviar. <laughs> I'd laugh at the irony of rationing gourmet provisions as I... starve. But for one thing... Caviar's fucking gross. <laughs> But, uh, I think, I think I'd, uh, I could do with some caviar at the moment. Um, I'm, uh, unfortunate there's, a there's, uh, running water, but, uh, but that only, um, uh, that only actually gets you so far. <laughs> uh, I haven't eaten in days. Uh, I, uh, I can't go much longer. I, uh, I, uh, I can't go much longer. Uh, part of me regrets throwing out all that liquor. <laughs> if I'm, uh, dying anyway, what's, uh, uh what's the difference? 
Might as well, uh... Might as well go out happy. Right? But, uh... But I'm glad I did. I, I, I know that voice. Uh, the, you know, the, the one that uh, says having a drink would make me happy. And I know it's a fucking liar. Yeah. I'm... Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm going to die. I am going to die. Fine, uh, fine. But, uh, <laughs> I'm going to die sober. That, <laughs> that makes me happy. I've, uh, I've been writing letters, uh, farewell to anyone I, I think deserves one, and, uh, <laughs> which is, uh, pretty much everyone. Uh, Louisa, Tyrell, Nika, Gemma, Jonas, and, uh, Wanda. <laughs> Even dipshit. <laughs> they, uh, they, they, they all helped me. Uh, one way or another, intentionally or not, I have, I found a tube that goes directly to the post office, and I, uh, wish I had found that one sooner. Oh well. Oh well. Uh, in my letters, I have, uh, I've told people where I am, and, uh, where to where to find me, and, uh, but, uh, uh but the letters still have to go through the mail processing, and will they be delivered? Will they, will they be delivered in time? You know, once received, will the recipients find a way into this sealed apartment in time? I don't believe they will. So, uh, <laughs> Oliver's has, uh, has quite a, a stamp collection going on in his desk, uh, and all of them are forever stamps, in an, uh, in, a, in an old design, actually, I, I didn't, uh, I didn't recognize. The a whole, a whole fucking drawer full, <laughs> he went all out in the moment and, you know, just but a shit ton of forever stamps when they were released so we'd never have to face another postage hike, which honestly is not the worst idea that he's ever had. Um, so I, uh, you know, I, 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 I borrowed them. Or, well, I guess they're mine now. And uh, no, I, I put one on each of, uh, each of the uh, farewell letters. Getting uh, from the uh, the desk to the pneumatic tubes takes several minutes. Standing is uh, quite difficult. Uh, my legs are uh, wobbly and uncooperative, and my vision is also wobbly. It's like um, I don't... <laughs> God damn it! It's like being drunk. Ah. Uh... <laughs> I, uh, I pass out several times on my way across the floor. Just like it's old times. And, uh... B but I, I, I get there. I, I get my letters uh, in, into the canister. I, I find the right uh, t tube. Uh, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's the one low onto the floor. Um, the one I thankfully can actually reach. You know, and I, uh... I manage it. Um, I get the um, canister into the, uh, the the tube, and uh, and I, uh, I I watch it shoot away, out of sight, out into the world. <laughs> I did it. I I did it. I. I said goodbye. <laughs> they'll know. They'll, they'll all, they'll all know. <laughs> uh, 
I love them. I love them. <laughs> Michael. Michael, say something. Please. Talk to me. You need to wake up. Oh, Michael, you look terrible. I, I haven't been able to... I haven't even been able to check on you all this time, ever since the ball, and now... Now... Now I can? But I can't access your mind. I can't tell what's happened. Michael... Michael, get up, please. I... I don't know what to do. What is that? Something's coming down the tube. Something big. It's the escape canister. Hippopotamuses. Uh, a big noise wakes me up. Hippopotamuses. Michael! Michael, I'm so glad you're- and now, steps a person. Someone I, I, I haven't seen in a long time. Hip uh, I know that voice. That voice. Oh my god. Dim Dimitri. Oh. oh. <sighs> wow. How did you know? Where are we? What are you doing here? How did you get here? Uh, I'm so... I'm so, I'm so hungry. Yeah, you look it. Hang on, I've got some gogurt. <laughs> All right, how's that? Gogurt. Mm. There you go. Slowly, slowly, your system needs to adjust to eating again. Take a break, and then we can have a little more. Dimitri? Leon's brother. You remember? It's been a while. Uh, I remember. I, uh, I, I got your letters. Did you? I'm glad someone did. Here, have a little more now. Oh. <sighs> Thank you. Thank you. Of course. Hey, oh, Michael, uh, I have to ask, where do you get that painting over there? It was, it was here when I got here. You know what that is, don't you? It's a boat. I, I like it. Yeah, it's a little bit more than that. It's the storm on the Sea of Galilee. Yeah, it's nice. Uh, I'm thinking of taking an, uh, you know, uh, an, an art history class. And, uh, you, 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 know, you can have it if you want. Uh, the guy who owns it is like it's, it's kind of an asshole it all starts with me and Dimitri bored on a Thursday so we decide we're going to show each other all the crazy hidey holes we found around Boston as kids like we both knew how to get into the old Park Street tunnels but there's so many crazy little places so we were like fuck it let's take a tour I showed him the old Revolutionary War powder house with a loose stone at the bottom that you can pull out. And he showed me his trick for sneaking into the basement of the Natural History Museum so you can see all the creepy dinosaur skeletons alone at night. And then I showed him the path to the homeless camp out behind Alewife Station. So then Scent Wipe's all, so what's the one place that creeps you out the most? I'm sorry, Scent Wipe? Dimitri, that's his nickname. Other people call him that too? Not yet. Are you sure you're friends? Look, lady, you want my story? I'll tell you my story. But if you're just going to crap talk my terms of endearment, well, you can fuck off back to lighting farts. Sure, fine. I mean, I could have taken this to my boy Chuck Octagon, but Dimitri specifically asked me to bring it to you, so here I am. But I've got Chuckle on speed dial, and I could scoot my ass over to 7 News anytime. Sorry. Scent wipe it is. Good. So I tell him about this crazy haunted closet office I saw when I was a kid, and he's like, cool, let's go check that shit out. Only, he says it more like, Let's investigate that anomaly, dear chap. But that's just because he's got his dick stuck in one of those old-timey great white explorer imperialist murder diaries. Slightly more British than I remember him, but otherwise, I know what you mean. So anyway, there's this abandoned Japanese restaurant on Vassal Lane that I used as a hideout when I needed to get out of Dodge as a kid. But this one time, I go down into the basement, you know, just to see what's down there. Lots of rats, cool place. So but then I notice a light under a door at the very back. 
And like, the place is run down, falling apart, except for this one door. It's way newer, and it has a serious lock on it. And I hear rustling around behind it. So I get brave, because I'm just a fucking kid, right? I knock on the door, ask who the fuck all is in there, and I hear some movement, and then the light goes out. I don't hear anything after that. So, of course, I pick the lock and crack that fucker open. Inside is an office with a desk and a chair and a flower vase full of celery stalks. I don't know what that was about, but everyone's got their kink, right? But, like, that's it. Nobody's home. But there's only the one door, no other exit. And that freaked me the fuck out. And I skedaddled my ass out of there and haven't gone back in years. So anyway, that's where I take Dimitri. The office is ransacked like someone packed up in a hurry. There's still celery in the flower base. It's some wilty mold barf looking shit, but still recognizably celery. So someone's been here only weeks ago. We start poking at everything. Like, I may have thought it was some kind of ghost when I was a kid, but now I know there's got to be a secret door or some shit. We check the back wall, we check the little bookcase, nothing. But then I check that weird ass face, and as soon as I move it, there's a click, and we hear something open. But where? Dimitri gets down on his hands and knees and crawls under the desk for a look, and holy fuck, there it is. A little door only as big as the space under the desk. We have to crawl into it. That goes into a tunnel, kind of like we're in an air duct, but sturdier. It's a huge pain in the ass. Like, if I were designing a secret tunnel for myself, I'd sure as fuck make it tall enough that I could stand up, but whatever. At the end, there's another door, but this one has a button next to it. We press it and immediately hear machinery. After a few minutes, the door splits and slides open. Like, it's a fucking elevator. With a tiny ass door, like some Willy Wonka and the Acid Factory bullshit. But tiny as the door is, the elevator is normal size. Now, there's only one button, so I hit it. The elevator kicks into gear and we're heading straight down. A TV screen pops on, one on each wall of the elevator, with like news feeds and stock prices and astrology predictions, and one channel that's kind of like the Puppy Bowl, but with guinea pigs. I like that one, but all in all, this is out of Willy Wonka and into some straight up Bond villain crap. So I'm like, scent wipe, if shit goes down, I hope you know how to put your fist into a face. But he's all, oh no, dear Mallory, I've never been one for fisticuffs. I live by my wits. So like, obviously, that dude's living on borrowed time already. But I like the fart brain doofus, so I brace myself to try to keep us both alive if this place is full of ninjas or killer robots or whatever. It's like another 10 minutes before we hit bottom, and the back of the elevator opens up. It's completely dark, which means there's probably nobody here. But as we step out of the elevator, the whole place lights up, like we've tripped a motion sensor, and whole tiers of light start kicking on one at a time, shooting back through this huge warehouse-looking space. In one corner is like a bed and a stove and a desk, like someone's been living down here. In another corner, there's like all this animal equipment, cages and tubes and feeders, like everything you'd need to keep and breed a whole lot of guinea pigs. No guinea pigs though. Most of it wouldn't even be salvageable, like the bedding's all mildewy and the cages are rusted and falling apart, just waiting to give some poor little guy an ass load of tetanus. So then we start working our way down the aisles. It's all shelves full of crazy shit. Buckets of watches, antique vases, old stereo equipment, and two whole rows of nothing but paintings. And Dimitri's like, Mallory, I know this shit. This shit's all stolen. Only he says it more like, Dear Mallory, I've identified these curious items which we've subjected to our inquiry, and I'm quite certain that they are purloined goods, one and all. So that's where he found the missing Rembrandt? The storm on the Sea of Galilee? Jesus and a barfing sailor hanging out on a boat? No, but that's where all the rest of them were. So then Dimitri gets distracted, matching stolen paintings to all the unsolved art heists that he's memorized for some reason. I keep going, and that's when I find the weirdest thing yet, the giant tube. The thing is nuts, this huge pipe with a man-sized canister in it. The canister's got a built-in chair, but it's upside down, and there's a door in it. I call Dimitri over to have a look, and he's like, you know what that is, Mallory? And I'm like, yeah, duh, I know what the fuck that is, scent wipe. It's a giant pneumatic tube. And he's all, yes, quite. And then he's all like, well, catch you later. And I'm like, dude, you're not just going to sit your ass in that creepy ass chair and flush yourself into who knows what. And he's all, Mallory, that's what I do. That's like my whole thing. And okay, yeah, that's true. Or he wouldn't have this stupid ass TV show that he's not actually on. But even so, he can't even prepare for the possibility of what might be on the other side of this thing. Assuming it doesn't just launch him straight to the bottom of the sea or something. And he's all, Mallory, I've already been to the bottom of the sea and it was fine. 
and then he climbs in, which isn't easy since it's upside down and he needs to get himself situated with a harness to hold him to the chair, and he's all, Mallory, could you give me a hand with this? But I tell him, no way. If he wants to do stupid, then he's got to do his own stupid. I'm not doing his stupid for him. But he manages anyway, then closes the door, smiles, waves, and hits the button on the arm of the chair. Then, whoop, he's gone. An hour goes by before the tube starts hissing again and the canister comes back. But when I open the door, it's that dweebus Michael Tate who falls out. And he's got that painting of Sailor Jesus rolled up next to him. We wanted to send the canister back for Dimitri, but the controls are only on the inside and you can't do anything until the door is closed. So we had to make other arrangements to get Dimitri back out. And where's Dimitri now? Right, like I'm gonna tell you. This is all you get, lady. A sighting and a story. Suck it up or shit it out, but that's the burger. Well, there you have it, folks. Dimitri Stamatis remains one step ahead of our investigation, but still finds time to solve the mystery of the 1990 Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum heist. Thank you for joining us on Inexplicable Riddles, The Hunt for Dimitri. Charlotte and Gemma were heading to Isabel's rail home to help plan the exodus. They walked through the revamped pedestrian walkway above Cedar Grove Station and waited for the right train. Commuters and citizens sailed around them, seeming like they were especially hurried. A few feet away, a busker stood perfectly still, a living statue spray-painted with silver and chrome. Can we go on a date soon? It's been a while since we did that, huh? Feels like forever. Would you prefer before or after I attempt to illegally rescue my former nemesis from the clutches of my former boss and current nemesis. After. After I know you're safe. Charlotte reached into her purse. She felt a... felt... felt a... I can't... I can't think. I can't take much more of this. Mr. Paletti, breathe. Think of a specific moment and concentrate. Try to move to it in your mind. There's... there's too much noise. Too much to know where to... how to... Let me show you something specific. The day you had a seance at Third Sight. Do you remember? You tried reaching out to communicate with me, and you were successful. I contacted you via nomadic tube, a residual spiritual connection left over from the presence of the very crystal ball you're being forced to come into contact with now. This action alerted the publisher to my presence, and he ordered the ball recovered. Then he used it for his own nefarious purposes. You are not approaching insanity. This is real. This is happening. Remember that moment, sitting in Third Sight's uncomfortable office chair. Yes, yes, the, the, the seance. <laughs> it knocked three times. Good. You're doing very well. I, I, this is getting more challenging to, to, to keep straight. Ah. Uh. Charlotte reached into her purse. She felt a sudden impulse to tip the busker, to force the human statue into movement. Having it still in that moment felt wrong, especially with her silent concerns about Gemma's involvement with the proposed rescue. As she watched the busker, the busker also watched her and recorded her every move. Huh. There's Isabel's train. There's no hat. There's, there's no place to tip. Charlotte! Charlotte! Get away from that thing! That's one of them. The cheese robots. What? Come on, into the train, now! Isabel Powell's rail home was crowded with people and plans, blueprints and maps, opinions and arguments. This small band of outsiders and strangers, refugees and reformers, commune members and would-be legislators huddled together, their numbers swelling all the time. They had two objectives, a rescue mission and a colonization. While it was getting increasingly difficult for them to successfully merge those plans, one thing was perfectly clear. If they expected people to follow them, they needed to give them time to prepare. People in Redline were about to get evicted, 
People were scared. People needed hope. And so, Isabel took control of Red Line's intercom to issue a bold proclamation. Greater Boston is written and produced by Alexander Danner and Jeff Andreessen, with recording and technical assistance from Mark Harmon. You can follow Greater Boston on Twitter at ingreaterboston or on Tumblr at greaterblogston.tumblr.com. Follow us there for news, updates, and behind-the-scenes chat about the show. Thank you to Patreon supporters Bridge and Rasmus. You too can support us on Patreon at patreon.com slash greaterboston. This episode featured Braden Lamb as Leon Stamatis, James Capabianco as Dipshit Paletti, Sam Musher as Emily Bespin, Mario De Rosa Jr. as Isaiah Powell, Julia Morizawa as Omi Agawa, Jessica Washington as Isabel Powell, Tanya Malojevic as Melissa Weatherby, Julia Prop as Luisa Alvarez, James Oliva as Michael Tate, James Johnson as Dimitri Stamatis, Joanna Bodnick as Mallory, Kristen DiMercurio as Fake Nika, Summer Unsen as Charlotte Lindsay Coolidge, and Lydia Anderson as Gemma Lindsay Coolidge. Additional voices, Vilte by Lute Vashute, Charlie on the MTA, and Tosa Waltz by Emily Peterson and Dirk Tidi. Shove That Pig's Foot a Little Farther in the Fire by Adrian Howard, Emily Peterson, and Dirk Tidi. Scottish Surf by Dirk Tidi. Tamlin set composed by Davey Arthur, Amy Can, and Liz Donaldson and performed by Dirk Tidi. Broke Yeti by Ryan Estrada. Transcripts are available at greaterbostonshow.com. Let's take that again. That's a little weird. It's a little weird to feel. There you go, There you go, Gert. I, you know, I'm trying not to laugh at Gogurt. There you go, Gert. I almost lost.
monster. Yeah, what was the? F it's like, how's that? Gogurt. It's like, all right. Gogurt, dummy. It can only be as good as you think it's gonna be. It's just fucking flavored cream shoved into a tube. For this is very strange. Why do we do this? The Gogurt gone wrong. I like, like thick yogurt. Like I get the real Greek yogurt. That's like mm -hmm. so do I. But I don't know. There's something different it. about it coming like, yeah. like coming in a, a tube. tube. <laughs> yeah, no, you expect something more drinkable. <laughs> At least no, you don't have to look at it with gogurt. Yeah. yeah. Like the Trix rabbit, right? Where it's like the Trix yogurt, where it's like purple and yellow. Yeah. Ah, the two colors of yogurt. Anyway, let's, let's see if we're recording that so we can uh, advertise the Patreon and have a whole discussion on yogurt. <laughs> yogurt and Greek yogurt. It's like yogurt on the go. Oh, wait, wait, I just got that.